Welcome to the 30th annual conference on the Sheikh and Science of the Rabbi Yisrael Arulay Research Institute on the Sheikh and the Sciences. This is the memory of the Rabbi Mokhm Sheikh, the youngest brother, Rabbi Yisrael Arulay, Ben Shabon Kedushas, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak. And first, I want to start by telling you the answer I got when I wrote in English Kodesh the night before the conference about our conference. And the answer was in Igor's Kodesh, Kelechot Chatz, page Kuf Lamed. Rabbi Melchim Sheikh writes, Yehi Rotson, Sheyehi HaKenes, Kemama Chazal, Tov Lehem, Betov Leolam. I'll bring that up on the screen. There it is. Yehi Rotson, Sheyehi HaKenes, Kemama Chazal, Tov Lehem, Betov Leolam. This is Lashon Chazal about when Sadiqim get together and make a kinus, that their kinus is good for them and it's good for the world. And Rabbi Kulam Tzadikim, Rabbi Malcolm Sheikh gave us this bracha. Now, the theme tonight is Stories and Tapashas, Phase 2. What does that mean? So we're going to start out talking about Stories and Tapashas in general. And then this concept, which I must admit is my own opinion, my own analysis, that there are phases in the Swords and the Plowshares prophecy and the historical unfolding of Swords and the Plowshares. Three phases. And I'll explain this as I go along. <clears throat> so here's the outline. First, we're going to talk about the prophecy itself. Then we're going to talk about the declaration at the United Nations that took place in 1992, January 31st, 1992. And then we're going to talk about specific countries like Russia and especially China. And based on that, we'll take another look at some specific points in the Sikha that the Rebbe Melchim Sheikh said about the Swords and the Plashas Declaration on Shamas Pashas Mishpatim, Tumshin and Beis. This was the day after the Declaration at the United Nations. And based on that, and kind of a new analysis of the prophecy, we'll see that there are three phases in the Swords and the Plashas development. And then we'll go back and take another look at China. A new analysis of China. And that's what I'm up to. So let's go talk about the prophecy itself. In the second parak of Yeshayahu, there is a very famous prophecy that is a few psukim long and it reads, starts out saying, that in Yemus HaMashiach, basically, the world is going to change. The Mashiach and the Beis Amigdash will be dominant, and the nations will come to Mashiach for instruction. Okay. And then at the end of that Nebuah, it says this famous, these famous words, the They, the nations of the world, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In other words, they will take their military equipment and transform it to agricultural equipment or in general, um, They'll take their military resources and transform them into peaceful uses. The nations will not raise a sword against each other. They will not make any more war. So basically, this means they will stop fighting wars 
And since they won't need their weapons anymore, they'll transform them to the peaceful uses. And as you may know, it was on these verses that the United Nations was first founded, uh, first at the end of World War II, but the, it started being organized actually while the war was still going on. In any case, outside of the United Nations, there is this garden. And in this garden, there is a very famous wall called the Isaiah Wall. And here's a picture of it. And on that wall is engraved this Pusik that we just read. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So this is uh, the foundation principle of the United Nations. And it took them a long time to get it straight. Um, but without going into details about the United Nations, let's skip ahead till January 31st, 1992, when there was this meeting at the United Nations. It was the first meeting they ever had between um, all among all the heads of state of the nations of the Security Council. And they came together and they made this declaration, uh, which we'll examine in some little bit of detail a little bit later. But the, the content of it was to phase out warfare and to countries stop fighting with each other. Rather, they start working together for the mutual benefit and the good of all mankind. And this is the declaration that the Malcolm Sheikh identified the next day at the Shabbos Parshas Mishpatim Kavangan as the beginning of the fulfillment of this Nebuah Vishayahu that the Chitza Chavosam Le'itim, they'll beat their swords into plowshares, etc. Now, <clears throat> Let's look at this, uh, first of all, with a little background. We may ask the question, why do they have to transform their weapons from military uses into peaceful uses? Why don't they just throw them out, get rid of them, destroy them? In fact, there is a Pusik and Tillam which says just that. And Chapter 46, Tarek Memvav of Tillam, there's a Pasuk that says, Mash vis milchomas ad This is talking about Yemosa Mashiach, that Hashem puts an end to all wars. He will put to rest all wars to the ends of the earth. Keshes Yeshaber, Nikitse Tzchanis, Agolos Yisrofaesh. will break the bows and arrows and cut the spears and including this is spears and arrows and spears of modern times, which would mean missiles and, you know, all kinds of high tech weapons. He will burn the chariots with fire. The tanks will basically be all be destroyed. That's what the Pasuk and Tillam says. But Yeshayo is going much further than that. He is saying that the nations of the world will First of all, we'll do this action of phasing out their weapons. And they won't just destroy them, but they'll turn them into peaceful uses. What's the difference? Why is that so important that the nations of the world take it upon themselves to do this? And that they transform it from military to peaceful instead of just throwing them out and destroying them? To understand this, let's take a look at the Sikhos. The Sikhos that the Rebbe Nelson Sheikh said this time of year in Tumshin Nun Aleph, 1991. And there were two Sikhos. One was Shamas Parshat Achrei Kedoshim. This was Rabbi Surah Leilem's Yorzeit, the day of the Yorzeit itself, Yud Gimel Eor. And then it continued, the theme continued in the next Shabbos in the Sikhos Parshat Amor. And basically, what the Rebbe Sheikh was talking about there was 
the transition from Gola to Gula. Gola is exile, Gula is redemption. Not just the transition from Gola to Gula, but the transformation of Gola into Gula. You see, look at these two words. Gola, which means Golus, exile, is spelled Gimel Vav Lamed Hay. The word, one of the four names for redemption, you know, we see by Yitzhak Mitzrayim, there are four words that Hashem used for redemption. Lotseisi, Vitzalti, Pegaalti, Vilakachti. That's why we have four cups of wine at the Seder and Pesach night. The one, the one which is most all-inclusive and most complete is the Goalti. It's the word Geula. And you see that Aleph is emphasized because that's the whole point of the Sikha. The Geula, the redemption in the sense of Geula, is a complete redemption, which takes Gola, takes the Golas itself and doesn't cast it away, but it transforms it. In other words, the goal is not to run away from Golas, not to escape Golas, but within, to work within Golas, to transform it by putting an Aleph into the word and changing the word from Gola to Geula, and thereby getting redemption. And what does that mean in practice? See, the Aleph represents Hashem. There's an expression in Chazal, one of the, the, the names by which Hashem is called is Alufo Shel Olam. Aluf means a master. Like in modern Israeli uh, Hebrew, they use the word Aluf for a military term for a general. Aluf Shel Olam is the master of the universe, God. So here's the difference between Geula, redemption, and Gola, exile. And the word Geula, the Aleph, is out in the open. It's part of the word. And the word Gola, the Aleph is hidden. You don't see it. That's the difference between Golos and Geula. In the time of Golos, we don't see these revelations from Hashem. He's, he's so to speak, working behind the scenes. He's hidden. But by us working in the ghost and bringing God into the open by learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, working towards bringing Mashiach, learning about Mashiach, publicizing Mashiach, we bring the Abishter out into the open. We bring the Aleph out into the open so it's part of the word now, it's not just Gimel Vav Lamed He, the original letters, but it's Gimel Aleph Vav Lamed He, which spells Ke'ula. And Rav Melch Meshach explains something about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim using this concept. By Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, you know, the, uh, the Jews were promised by Hashem to go out of Mitzrayim with great wealth. So that's why before they left, they they asked the Egyptians for the various precious materials that they had, gold and silver and precious stones, uh, objects that were made from gold and silver and precious stones. And the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians gave it to them. Chazal explained that, that, that the Egyptians not just gave it to them, you know, begrudgingly, but gave it to them happily with their own goodwill and they gave them they gave the Jews even more than they asked for and what was the point of this Rabbi Mocham Shech said I mean they Hashem could have just forced the Mitzvah to give them the the money the gold and uh, it would have fulfilled the promise to Avram Avinu that his descendants would go out of the dollars of Mitzrayim with great wealth but no, if it would have been like that, it would not have been a geula. What made it a geula, in other words, a complete redemption, is that there was a complete transformation of the Egyptians themselves. Like Hashem kept saying when he was bringing the makos on Mitzrayim, this, 
that the Yodu Mitzrayim Kiyami Hashem, that Mitzrayim themselves, the Egyptians themselves, themselves will reach the awareness that Hashem is the master of the universe, God, the, the one God, the God of the, of the Jews. This is a quote from the Sikha. That's why this had to be done, this had to be accomplished, not by forcing the Egyptians to do it, but by them doing it of their own free will and their own goodwill. And as we said before, they gave the Jews more than they asked for. <clears throat> the point is that by doing this, all this wealth that the Egyptians had, which was really, how, why, why, why did God make it so that the Egyptians had this wealth? So that they would give it to the Jews when the Jews left Egypt to fulfill the promise to Avram Avinu. Thereby, the purpose for which this wealth was created by Hashem was accomplished. This purpose was attained, that this wealth was given to the Egyptians and in order to fulfill the promise of the Mabino that it be given to the Jews when they left Egypt. So by the Mitzrim, the Egyptians doing this of their own free will, the Gola itself was transformed to Gula. The Egyptians themselves were transformed. Now, let's apply this concept back to our stories and the plowshares. By just taking you take your missiles and you take your aircraft and you take your tanks and nuclear weapons and discard them, destroy them. Okay, you got them out of circulation. That's a very nice, you have a better world. But if you take them, the Chitsu Chaposam Le'itim, if the nations of the world reach the point where they attain this understanding that why did Hashem, why did God put this knowledge and high-tech uh, information and technology in the world in the first place, not so that we kill people with them, but so that we help people with them. So they take this technology and transform it to, to peaceful uses. Then you have a gula. Then you have the golus, the gola, being transformed into gula, bringing out the presence of God and Attaining the purpose for which God put this technology in the world in the first place. Uh, I've written extensively about this transformation of military to peaceful in my book, Scientific Thought in Messianic Times. And I would say, I think that one of the most extreme examples that I've come across is an example where the nuclear material from decommissioned atomic bombs, uh, a, a nuclear material called Yitrim-90 has been transformed to be used as a cure for cancer. So I think there are no two greater extremes than taking a nuclear weapon which is designed to destroy people globally and transforming it into a cure for uh, a machla disease God protect us, you know, Islam, a cure for such a disease which is devastating people all over the world. Okay. <clears throat> now let's take a look at the UN Declaration itself. The UN Declaration, as we said, was a declaration made by the 15 members of the Security Council. The Security Council itself has five permanent members and 10 rotating positions. So I think if we are to track how the world has held by this commitment that made in 1992 to transform the militar militarism to peace and cooperation and mutual help for the good of all mankind, we should look mostly at the five permanent members of the Security Council. The Security Council had made the declaration, and it was more than anyone, any other nations, it would be the five permanent members on the Security Council 
that are responsible for maintain, maintaining it and, and especially living up to it themselves. So if you look over the past uh, 30 years, basically almost, um, it's that England and France have not been involved in any wars. Even China hasn't. And China is our, our, our big problem right now, our big topic tonight. We'll go, we'll come back to China. The US has been involved in wars, but these are not the old fashioned kind of wars of one country trying to dominate another. These are anti-terrorist types of wars, anti-terrorist activity, especially like uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and Al Qaeda and ISIS, anti-terrorist activity in Syria also. Um, Russia, of all the five members of the Security Council, has uh, has its ups and downs. Now they they have been involved in wars. There was a war in Georgia uh, back in the nineties, but it was not. It, just to to be clear, it was a short war, as wars go, and relatively few people died in it. Again, as wars go, um, Ukraine. The situation with Ukraine is is a lot more complex, especially because um, Russia, in, in the case of Crimea, Russia annexed it, um, but this was not military activity to annex it. They did not uh, start a war. And furthermore, there was an election there, and the people there voted. You know, this to me was a. Uh, Kind of a fair election, at least as fair as the United States elections these days. Um, they voted to go with Russia. Okay, but anyway, it's yes, Russia was involved in wars. Okay, um, we have to talk about that. We have to figure out uh, if there was such a commitment to no more wars. You know what happened. In the meantime, I just want to point out that Russia is not, and especially Putin, is not the bad guy that he's made out to be in the West. It is kind of conventional wisdom in the West, Western Europe, United States, to vilify Russia, especially Putin. He's a bad guy, he's a bad actor, he's our enemy. It's really not true. Um, a lot of this is politics. And I don't want to get into the politics now, Democrats and Republicans, it's, uh, it's a bad situation. Let's just leave it at that. But the fact is that after the communist government fell, um, Russia was really put down by the rest of the world, unfortunately, and by the West. It was looked down upon and looked at as a loser that they lost their power. And if there's one phrase we could borrow from President Trump to apply to Russia and to Putin, it would be that Putin was, his major focus was to make Russia great again. Um, not as a dominant world power, like under the communists. Uh, the communists, part of the ideology is world domination. But Russia, it has not been like that. What they want is clearly to dominate in their own region. And specifically, they don't want NATO on their border. That's one of the problems with Ukraine. Ukraine is interested in, keeps trying to join NATO, and that would put NATO right on the Russian border. And that would, they would, they would feel threatened if NATO is on their border. Now, I point out here that Putin is not an anti-Semite. Why is that important? Well, because we're Jewish and uh, we don't like anti-Semites. We don't want people, the world leaders to be anti-Semites or anyone to be an anti-Semite, but it's more than that. When you look throughout history at, uh, you know, absolute rulers who were very 
uh, the father, they're almost always anti Semites, you know, using the Jews as scapegoats and in part of their political agenda to, to distract from whatever else, whatever problems there might be in their country by blaming it on the Jews. It's very clear that Putin is not an anti Semite. He's a, a good friend of Israel, a very good friend of Netanyahu, a very, very good friend of the chief rabbi of Russia, Beryl Lazar, and everything, uh, everything, all relations between Russian government and the Jews, the Russian government and Israel has, has all been good. Uh, even during that very touchy war in Syria, where Russia was involved on the side of the Assad and Israel had to take military action there too to protect its, its own interests. Uh, Russia and Israel coordinated their activities so that the airspace that they were both using would not would you know they would alternate they would make sure that there, there was no conflict uh, between Russian planes and Israeli planes. Okay, so they had a, a, a very tight cooperation between them. There's a, a professor, Stephen Cohen, who wrote a book on, who has been an expert on Russia since way back in the communist era. And he's written about this, about Putin and Russia. And he's, he's also taking, you know, explaining this position that Putin is not the bad guy made out to by, by Western uh, politics, which is what it is, it's, it's politics. And uh, he emphasizes that Putin is not an anti-Semite, which, which is a sign of a uh, of good guy, of a normal person, rather than a power-hungry um, maniac. OK, that's all I want to say about Russia. Uh, China is a different story. China is still a communist country. China still has a vision to dominate the world, not just its own region of the world, Southeast Asia, but they want to dominate the world. Uh, how bad is this? We will see soon. But let's see. Let's see how this relates to military activity and especially our Swords into Plowshares program. And this will bring us to analyze phases of the Swords into Plowshares transformation. Let's go back to 2017. There was a very strong buildup of the Chinese military uh, forces in, in the South China Sea because of islands that China claimed were theirs and uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the world did not agree with China on that at all. And especially there are other countries, Philippines and other countries in the, in the South, in that area, South China Sea, that said that those are our islands, are not China's. Okay, but it kept getting serious. Uh, China kept building up more and more military strength in the South China Sea. And around that time, our old friend Gorbachev, um, remember him, who is no longer, uh, you know, has any political position, but is still involved in uh, political organizations and analysis, political analysis and stuff like that, wrote an article in Time Magazine. And he said, look around you, you see the world is preparing for war. Every country is, is getting more militarized and this looks like the, the, the whole world is going to be a world war. Well, there was no war. Um, I referred to an interesting report by Bloomberg News at that time that said that it, after giving a long, long report about how tense the situation is and how likely it is that there would be a war, they finally say, but there probably will be no war. Why? Because China would not want to interrupt 
the trillions of dollars worth of trade going through that area in the South China Sea every year, and it would be a big loss to them. So there would probably be no war. There was no war. At that time, I talked to a, um, a scientist I know who is, works in the Defense Department, who said that if there was, a, if there would be a war, a war quotes, it would probably be just a game of chess. What the game of chess, where the two sides are like positioning themselves to to put pressure and to threaten the other one, but there's no military conflict comes out of it. Having said that, let's uh, jump ahead to our this year from our own time right now. We have seen in recent weeks. Um, a buildup of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. And everybody, at least in the West, once again, is, is, is was running scared how um, uh, Russia is about to invade Ukraine. Now, I have a daughter and her family who lives in Kharkov, Ukraine. And I called her up and uh, wanted to get her take on it. And she said simply, yeah, nobody's talking about it over here. So it wasn't, you know, we, the news, the media sometimes makes a bigger sensational, not sometimes, all the time, to make a big sensation out of something which may not be so sensational. Now, to be clear, Russia had a uh, about 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border, okay? And seriously, where, where do you put 100,000 troops on the border of another country if you're not planning an invasion? But here's the thing, and these are different times. This is the source of the Plowshares era as, as one uh, uh, political organization, you know, social uh, science organization, um, describe this era is that it's the era it's a war averse world the world is not like war people don't like war anymore and in as a matter of fact just the friday before our conference um which would have been the 11th day of year russia or putin suddenly announced that he's pulling back all these troops seems uh, whatever, he's just saying it was like a military exercise and he's pulling back all the troops. That, my friends, is what we call a game of chess. We have no intention of, of, of harming anyone. You are just moving your pieces here and there to the uh, other side of the board to exert pressure as you, for whatever, you know, psychological purposes. <clears throat> Come back to China, it's a different story. China is, uh, okay, there was no war in the South China Sea in 2017, but China is still moving its pieces around the chessboard. In fact, uh, just recently, I heard on a, uh, a news report, they were interviewing some official from the current administration, the United States government, and he used the same muscle about China and the United States. He said, they're playing chess with us, but we better make sure that we're not playing checkers with them. In other words, chess, chess is nevertheless a pretty serious game and, and we have to keep our eyes open and our minds sharp. This brings us to Radcliffe. John Radcliffe was the director of national intelligence under President Trump. And on December 4th, 2020, he wrote the following in an article in the Wall Street Journal. You see it in front of you here. He said, the People's Republic of China poses the greatest threat to America today and the greatest threat to democracy and freedom worldwide 
since World War II. Now that sounds pretty bad. That sounds pretty bad. That does not sound like the source and supply chain type world, does it? At least as far as China's concerned. However, we are going to look into the whole thing a little bit more analytically and see if we can clarify this issue. Let's go back <coughs> to the prophecy itself of Isaiah, those, those Psukim and second paragraph of Ishayahu, and the Sikha that the Rebbe Nochum Sheikh said on Pashas Mishpatim, Tamshinun Beis, about the swords and the Pashas era having begun, that the prophecy has begun to be fulfilled. Look at the Pasuk. It says, the kids of Chabos and Litim Mechan is the same as Mazmeros. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Lois a girl by Sheriff. They're going to stop fighting. Loyum do Od Muhammad. They won't learn any more war. Now, the the general idea of these Tsukim is they're going to stop fighting. They're not going to need their weapons anymore. So they're going to transform them to peaceful uses, as we explained before. But if that's the whole story, then something is lechora out of order because what it should say these phrases in in, a, in, the, in the opposite order first lo yisal goyal goy they're going to stop fighting with each other lo they won't learn any more war whatever that means and so, since they're not going to be fighting with each other, or even learning any more warfare, then they're no more use for their weapons. They'll beat, beat their swords into plowshares. So the Psukim should read, and then the kids have also eaten, but it's the same as Mero, so nothing to do with their weapons. So they'll start using them, the technology and the materials and the money. That's used for weapons, so start using it for good things. Okay, that seems to be how the, the logical order of the Sukkim should be. And this question needs to be answered. Now let's take a look back at the Sikha. This is a, a direct quote from the Sikha right here in front of you. And the Sikha, where the Ramach Meshach says about the declaration of, at the United Nations and the new era and that the prophecy of Yeshua has begun to be fulfilled, he describes their declaration as follows. <coughs> that they made a declaration for Tukufa Chadosha Biyachse Medina Sa'olam, a new era in international relations, which is as follows. Beetle Matsav Shomuchomos Bain Medinos Olam. You're canceling the situation of warfare between nations of the world. Sheisvate Gambit Simsum of Beetle Klein Neshek. That this will be expressed also by arms reduction and canceling arms altogether. The Adla Shalom the Achtus. Going as far as making peace and unity. Shituf Pu'ula, working together, Bezra Hadadis, Bain Medina Sa'olam, Ezra Hadadis, helping each other between the nations of the world, that they will help each other and they'll work together. Litovas Renushos Kula, for the good of all mankind. Okay, so that's that's the, that's the description of their declaration, the swords and the plowshares. Uh, Initiation. What I want to focus on, as you probably guessed, is this phrase here highlighted in red. Beetle not some shomu komos. It doesn't Zemna from Sheikh doesn't say that they that their the Kupa Khadash involves canceling can, no more wars, period. But Beetle not some shomu komos, which I think means the canceling. The situation, matzav, yeah, 
situation. Canceling the situation of warfare. In other words, warfare is no longer part of the political diplomacy. It's no longer part of international relations. Like you get mad at one country, gets mad at another country. So it used to be okay, we're going to go to war against you. Can't do that anymore. Nobody wants to do that anymore. It's not part of the, the program. It's not an option. And it could be extreme situation, but but like it's it's not so much that they're promising not to fight any more wars just yet, but but this whole situation where you go to war, that is off the table. That's that's not what you do anymore. That's not considered acceptable diplomacy. With that in mind. I would just explain this quote from the Sikha. And to answer our question about why the, the Psukim are the Kitsu and then Lo Yisra Gael Bechera and then Lo Yul Madur Mokoma instead of the reverse, and I propose the following. And I admit that this is my own analysis and my own idea. And uh, as we say, Bli This is my own understanding that there are three phases in the sorts of the process transition and transformation of the world. And so I wrote this in Hebrew to be clear with the terms being used. And also because most of the people listening are probably Israelis. Shlav Aleph. The first phase of the chitzuchavosim leitim, they beat their swords into plowshares. That's why this pasuk is first in the, the list of the three phrases that we quoted before from the psukim. This one is first. First, they beat their swords into plowshares. Meaning what? Given shalom, since they agreed on on this era of peacefulness, bito matur shomuchanos. Take warfare off the table, induce armaments, mutual assistance, mutual help, and cooperation. Since they all agreed on that, Vito Master Shomu Hamas, and all things in the Sikhamab, Chilim Lapoch, Kremo Hamal, Kerem Shoson, they start phasing out their weapons. They start right away transforming their weapons to peaceful uses. Now, this happened. This happened throughout the 1990s. Many, many countries, not just the big uh, superpowers, United States and Russia and, and Kazakhstan, you know, the whole former Soviet Union, uh, even China was transforming weapons to peaceful uses. And I document this, documented this at great length in, in my book, Scientific Thought Messianic Times, Chapter 3. This was going on extensively, and it's still going on. But but there are still some isolated wars going on in the world. Like I mentioned, Russia and Georgia. Okay, so this brings to phase two, Shlav Beis. There are no more wars. No more wars at all in phase two. There are no military confrontations. Okay. And you can see amazingly how uh, China has not taken any military action in the South China Sea, even though it's been threatening since, uh, you know, since 20, let's say since 2017, or, or even before. But just because they're not fighting military conflicts anymore, that doesn't mean that that everything is uh, hunky dory, so to speak. You know, they they have they may not have reached their you know mutual cooperation completely. There is still, especially by communist countries, China, uh, for example where they still believe in world dominance and there's still a motivation 
for one country to dominate another country, even among non-communist countries, sometimes. So they have to find other ways to dominate each other, to put pressure on each other, non-military ways. Lomdim, see, because phase three is, the number says, lo yilmadu od no pama. In the phase three, they're not going to learn any more wars. Mashma, we infer from that, that before that phase, phase two, they are learning wars. They are learning new methods of warfare, non-military methods of warfare. Lomdim ofanim acherim lishot echad al They learn other methods of dominating each other to go on cyber warfare. Okay, cyber warfare is a very effective way to for one country to mess up the the internal affairs of another country and and to even gain domination over another country. And we'll see more about this right away. But the point is that they're not they're not interested and in, they're not willing to even they're not they don't have the the motivation the i even say they don't have the guts anymore to start a war to fight another country to dominate them they would rather use cyber warfare information warfare economic warfare all those other kinds of soft warfare which you might say they're fair game because the other country, you know, who's been victimized by the cyber warfare, these are, you know, like the United States has been attacked with, with uh, hacks from other countries and cyber warfare. But we have plenty of uh, cyber security engineers, you know, where, where have they been, you know? Why all the, the lack of security that makes us uh, vulnerable to the cyber warfare? It's like it's like a game of chess. The other, like that that uh, government official said, they're playing chess with us. We better make sure we're not playing checkers. You know, they're they're playing chess against us. We have to defend ourselves with chess pieces. This is this is a it's a game, but it's a serious game. Finally, Shlam Gimel, the third phase of sorts of the Pashas is Loyal Mado no Chama. They're not even going to do any cyber warfare. They're not going to look for other ways of dominating each other, things like that. So you might say, what are they going to do with all their time? If you're not looking to dominate the next guy and, and uh, you're living happily. What are you going to do with yourself? Well, this is described best by Rambam in the very last halakha of Rambam. But it's also the very last halacha of his laws of Mashiach. He says what they'll do. He says in when the Gula, and this is like the what's called the second stage of the Gula, the Kupa Shnia, he says, Lo yer sham lo rod la mukhama. There will be no famine, no war. La rod la mukhama will appear in the Sakhras. There won't even be jealousy or competition. Why? There'll be abundance of good. Everybody will have whatever they want. No, no point to go to war against somebody, even to try to dominate somebody. If you have everything you want in your own country, plenty of food, plenty of money. So what are everybody going to do with their time and their energy and their, you know, their resources? Rambam says, Lo yeah, the, the preoccupation of the whole world, this is not just the Jews, but even the non-Jewish nations of the world, they will be only interested in knowing about Hashem, knowing about God. And that's the real truth about God, the God of Israel, the one God, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Like Rashi says, now this is our God, but in most of Mashiach, it will be the one God for the whole world, that everybody will recognize him and everybody will serve him uniformly. That will be the complete Ka'ula, Gula Shlema. And that's the third phase of Swords and Departures. They're not learning warfare, they're learning about God.
Um, so my opinion, we're, we're somewhere around here in the second phase. And the wars that we're dealing with are going to be mostly cyber warfare. And this brings me back to China. And the threat that China poses to the world, as Mr. Radcliffe says, where is he? That they are the greatest threat to America today and to the free world. Um, it is a amazing and interesting fact that China itself does not try to hide its intentions about its goal of world domination. And they even made public how they intend to do it. And this is, uh, among others, a publication in 1999. Two colonels from the Chinese Air Force published a, a book called, well, translated with this uh, funny sounding title, Unrestricted Warfare. Now, the title does not mean in English what probably it meant in, to them in Chinese. Unrestricted warfare would sound like, uh, you know, no holds barred warfare, go to war, do anything, do everything, no restrictions, atomic bombs, nuclear weapons, you name it, we'll use it. It's the exact opposite. Unrestricted warfare means warfare that is not restricted to just using military weapons. Other kinds, in other words, war, warfare that's not military, war, warfare that uses other weapons, other kinds of weapons like cyber warfare. And this is what they describe right here in these paragraphs that I'm quoting <coughs> from their booklet, translated. Um, and uh, I'll read through this. In these three little paragraphs, you get the whole picture. We are, in, this is the, these. The, the Chinese military colonels, Air Force colonels, writing about the, the, the Chinese military philosophy for the coming years. We are in a transitional period in a weapons revolution from considering explosive power as the measure of a weapon to a new period in which information is the measure of the weapon information wars basically is what they're describing to our way of thinking a planned stock market crash a computer virus attack making the currency exchange rate of an enemy country erratic and spreading rumors on the internet about the leaders of an enemy country in other words information warfare all this can all be thought of as new concept weapons these are the new weapons don't need bombs and airplanes and uh, missiles anymore. These are the new weapons, the cyber warfare. Technology, they continue. Technology has changed where the battlefields are. The First World War was fought in trenches along a very long line. The combination of weapon system can create a new kind of technical space, a new battlefield that never existed before. Electronic and information technologies have created a net space which can become a battlefield. The battlefield extends simultaneously at the micro, medium range, and macro level, as well as in various hybrid technical spaces in ways it never did before. The battlefield is everywhere. No? Sound exciting. The battlefield is everywhere, but the weapons are electronic. And here, this, this third paragraph focuses on their, uh, their strategy of attacking, the tactics. The first and strongest challenge to appear thus far is from the computer hackers. Hackers, mostly people without military training, rely only on their own technical skills, 
easily penetrate military and national security computer systems. A hacker might in some cases have the same impact as an atomic bomb. So we don't need atomic bombs anymore. We're gonna dominate another country by sending our computer hackers to hack into their systems. That's China. That is the threat they pose, but it's not a military threat. And we have, we and all civilized countries now have cybersecurity and cybersecurity technicians who should be able to put up a good defense against hackers and so on. But again, it's a fact that the United States has been very lax on this and very, you know, the general United States has a attitude of uh, we're okay, we're secure, we got oceans on both sides of us, you know, very kind of uh, laid back and, and self-secure. But again, if they're playing chess with us, we better make sure we're not playing checkers. Now, that's the good news to conclude with is a quote from the Rebbe Melech Mashiach way back in 5750, which is um, the end of 1989, actually, where the Rebbe Melech Mashiach is talking about changes that have taken place in major changes in major nations in the world, um, talking about how the world is changing. This is uh, Before the announcement of Higazman Galaskan, before the announcement that uh, the time of the redemption was here, just before that, he's talking about how nations of the world are changing. And here's a quote from the Sikh of Shamas Parshas Toldos, Tom Shinun, 5750. And the nation of China in recent times, a quiet and calm revolution has been taking place regarding its domestic policy and also its relations with the other nations of the world. Its domestic policy and its international relations has been an improvement. And indeed, you know, of course, it, it, those who have been uh, following China since uh, the communist era, you know, it's still communist, but uh, it has changed and modified and come more in line with the rest of the world, although they still have a long way to go. Um, and as, as is often the case with these dictatorships, communist countries, uh, on <clears throat> like North Korea, and other dictatorships like, like Iran, it is not the people of the country that are militaristic who want to want to dominate other nations, <coughs> but their government. There's a big difference between the Chinese Communist Party, which has a strong hand rule over China, and the people of China. And there's a lot of opposition to the Chinese Communist Party, but they cannot, you know, they have to be careful because China has no qualms about uh, arresting, attacking, executing its own citizens. But these changes have taken place and it is, it has improved, it has a ways to go but here is something to look forward to. An expert on China named Gordon Cheng, who is of Oriental origin himself, but he's a American, uh, frequently on, consulted on news programs, and he's written books on China, and his, his most recent book, The Coming Collapse of China, meaning the Chinese Communist Party, the government, 
is it's predicting its collapse. And uh, let's read the book and find out the details, but the point is that it's going to happen and it's going to be the third phase of Swords and Plowshares where the hackers are not going to be a threat. That's going to be phased out too. The hackers are going to go to, you might say, Balchuvia Shivas and forget about learning cyber warfare and start learning about Hashem. The only preoccupation of the whole world will be to know Hashem. We should see the Rebbe Nelchem Shech completing the Gula immediately now. Take us near Mamash. Amen. Can you hear us? Ich hier an der Nähe, mein Rabbin, Melchem, Schäf, Leulam, Wald.